Awesome. So thank you. Uh, earlier, y'all heard a lot about the petroleum and uh, engineering side of extracting it. And so I'm going to basically go on the other end and say, hey, this is how we find it. And uh, using a, a workflow that I used uh, in New Zealand. And it's not just, you know, covering your eyes and throwing a dart. There's a science behind it. And so um, I'm doing the geophysical analysis of the myopleistine manga formation. This is to... Uh, help in better exploration within the Parioc 3D survey. This is uh, Taranaki Basin offshore New Zealand. So just an overview, I'm gonna do a quick introduction, go through the methods of the workflow and basically the science behind it, what results we use, discussion of our comparisons to an analog in the area, our conclusions and then references. And I do have to thank GNS Science, uh, Ministry of Business and New Zealand Petroleum and Minerals. All the data that I'm using was completely free. They have an incentive program to where they gather all information after like two or three years from all the companies and provide it to the public at no cost. And GNS does a lot of the uh, research and that's their crown institute for the petroleum industry over there. So just a geographic overview. We're located uh, in New Zealand. New Zealand split into two islands, North and South Island. We're located on the North Island. The region, uh, the nearest city is New Plymouth. The basin is called the Taranaki Basin. This is our survey outline in purple. Our one well of interest, there's only been one well that was drilled in this area, it's the Aurora One. And then we have a series of oil and gas fields just surrounded, uh, around it. We have the Taranaki uh, Volcano, appropriately named. And then our two main uh, areas of interest uh, for any exploration activity within this area is the Maui and Tui Field. Maui is one of the largest gas producers in the um, Taranaki Basin. Our seismic data was acquired in 2005. It was reprocessed in 2012. So it's uh, up to date with more techniques and, and better processing skills. And we are given a, a series of well log data, log suite, petrophysical analysis, core photos, and this is all by GNS and Petroleum Institute and Minerals. So just a little introduction of why this came to be. In 1992, they drilled the Aurora One well, and this was on a series of 2D lines. If you can see these dotted lines, that's the 2D line and uh, additional 2D lines. So in between these lines, there's no data. This is all extrapolated. And the size of this is about an OCS block uh, offshore uh, deep water Gulf of Mexico. So it's a couple of square miles that are just empty right here. And a couple of square miles, that's, that's significant. So the 3D survey actually fills in these holes and gives us a lot more information. And so the Aurora One well drilled in 1992. This was targeting uh, bright amplitudes on 2D seismic. Uh, what had ended up happening is they didn't get anything, but they got a lot of geological information from it, a lot of reservoir analysis, and uh, a better understanding of the geology offshore in this area. And so they released their petroleum reports of what happened with the well and what they encountered. And they said, okay, there's reservoir quality in the manga formation and in the Moki formation. So that's the focus of this study is more in the manga formation. So in order to find an area of interest in here, you have to understand the structure. And so uh, Taranaki Basin, it's split into three structural zones. You have the uh, Eastern Mobile Belt, which is around here. This is characterized by normal faulting and inverted uh, normal faults. And so what basically a normal fault is, is basically if you take your two hands at an angle and you bring one down, that's a normal fault. A reverse fault is whenever it goes up. And so that's important for us to understand for our depositional environments actually locating sands. And uh, then we have the Western Stable Platform. This is little to no faulting, but it's bounded to the east side by the Cape Agman Fault, which is one of our large fault zones in the area. And then we have the Northern Graben, which is our specific area of interest. Northern Graben area is just right here. And Graubens are just consist or characterized by a series of normal faults. And so we're bounded to the west by the Cape Agnet Fault and bounded to the east by the uh, Turi Fault Zone. So these are important for us because in order to find hydrocarbons, we have to have uh, faulting for trapping and migrations, which I'm going to go further into in a bit. Stratigraphy of our area, what's important I don't know if it comes out too well, but it's pretty faded. But what's important for our area is the reservoir of interest is the myopleistine manga formation. This is uh, a series of basin floor turbidites, and what turbidites are are just massive deposits of sand in, in our case. And so lithology is very fine to find sandstones, a bit of uh, an sandstone, so this isn't just purely quartz. 
This is a series of uh, feldspars and quartz, which is important to note for diagenesis. And then our one analog that we have is our commercial gas, Corora One Well. So the Corora One Well is located towards the northeast, many, many, many miles away. Here's our well of interest, our Corora One, the blue, and this is the green. This is probably over 5,000 miles. So here we have the uh, well right here. This is our Aurora One well. Our area of interest is within this package right here. As you can see, it's kind of silty to sandy, but uh, it, this isn't hitting our target. This is more of using for modeling. And this is what we would like to expect in our area of interest is the Aurora One well, a nice sand package with shales uh, trapping uh, and sealing above and below. So in order to locate oil and gas, in order to even propose something, you have to have your petroleum system in place. So petroleum system, it requires that you have a source rock. Where did your oil and gas come from? Was it mature enough? It has to go from one place to the next, so you need your migration. You have to have somewhere to put it in, something to put it in, so that's our reservoir. And then you have to have some sort of uh, seal in order to keep it there and trap it. So that's, uh, or my Pleistocene uh, giant forceps formation. So reservoir being our manga formation, which is located just in here in a stratigraphic column. It's about uh, Miocene to Pliocene in age. Then above that, you have your giant forceps formation. So that's trapping everything so where it doesn't go up even further. And it's also uh, dependent on our source rock. Source rock is in here because it's so old and so deep that uh, it, it's, it's, it, I couldn't put it in here just for, for purposes of illustration. But the, uh, our source rocks are the Paleocene Waipawa shale and Cretaceous uh, Rokoki formation. These both host about 2 to 6% uh, TOC. TOC is just an amount of organic material that's in your rock, and this is uh, dependent on, I guess, the, the algae, your uh, trees, and other organic material at the time. So our methods that we use, first we have to look at our well log. And we have to say, okay, well, is there anything in here that's, that's a question? And so what we did is looked at, uh, looked at our manga formation. And within here, we have this little spike right here, which I'm proposing to be part of a turbidite system. So this is uh, characterized off of the gamma ray curve. We also used our resistivity curve. Resistivity basically tells us is there water, is there oil, and all of this, it, there's no uh, oil or gas in here. And so what it is is that we had uh, a, a wet reservoir, which was good for modeling because we had an extreme case of what we don't want. Then we use seismic attributes and amplitude versus offset. So a coherence is uh, basically taking your wavelets and it's defined as seeing how similar wave traces are in your seismic. These are fantastic for, founding, for finding boundaries of similar to unsimilar uh, instances of wavelets. So diagram right here, how it's compared, you just have one central wavelet. It's going to be compared to the adjacent waves, la, wavelets, and a nominal value is returned, and it's going to tell you, okay, this is how similar this is. And it's also going to be <coughs> compared, lastly, to these, uh, these further out ones. So these are useful for false fracture identification and uh, stratigraphic features. Here's a little diagram. Here's what you normally see in amplitude. As you can see, there's some sort of disturbance right here, but you can't really tell. This is only telling us a difference in rock properties. And so what our uh, coherence slice is telling us is where things are similar, where it's white, and where things are dissimilar is where it's black. And so when you have these dissimilar areas, these high contrasts are going to po point out features. And with this, you can see a meandering channel coming through which is of an area of interest. So this is helping us bring out stratigraphic features. One of the other seismic attributes that we used was the average energy. This is basically an amplitude emphasis. Instead of reading the words, the equation is basically just a square of your root mean squared, which is a lot easier to use because it really brings it out from your background amplitudes. And so our uses for this are for di direct hydrocarbon indicators, stratigraphic variations, porosity, and lithology variations. Here's just an example from the actual data set, is that here's a regular amplitude section. This is our bright amplitude or reservoir of interest right here. And as you can see, it, it, it has a nice signature and whatnot, but you really have all this mess back here. You really want to isolate this event to, quantitate, to uh, further quantitate uh, this area. 
So the average energy really makes this pop out. Everything else is pretty much whited out. We see lateral terminations to the left and uh, to the right where our fault uh, is bounding. So that's what we use this for. We also use amplitude versus offset. Amplitude versus offset is basically dependent on your rock properties as your way for seismic acquisition changes from 90 degrees to 40, uh, 45 degrees or so. And so this is to use to distinguish uh, false bright spots from real bright spots. They have four main classes. Uh, what you can have is basically a decrease or increase uh, with amplitude and offset, polarity reversals. You can have a uh, increase with negative in offset and then a decrease with uh, offset in negative amplitude. And then lastly, uh, what we use for this is uh, fluid replacement modeling. This is using Gassman's equation. And uh, this is basically for forward modeling and it's what we use to take the original fluid out, still keep all the rock properties the same and put another uh, fluid in, and in this case gas, in order to model what response we're gonna get from that. So this is the equation. These are all the variables. I'm not really gonna go too much into detail with it. Uh, Analog, so our analog as mentioned earlier, this is important for us because we need to see, okay, are we just making stuff up? Is it reasonable? And is, is, is this anything important for us? So Kuro uh, one well located just over here actually found the Kuro field which was drilled in 2002. It was targeting the same formation, which is important for us because the rock properties need to be the same. It uh, found biogenic gas, so it needs to be gas in our case because this is uh, sort of the window uh, we're in for, for maturation. Then we also uh, had to find out, okay, well, what was the main risk in here and how can we make this better? And so the main risk over here is that they had little to no faulting, so for migration it was a lot harder and that's why it's biogenic instead of thermogenic in this case. And here's our survey outline just, just in relation to this well. And here's our well located just right here. So as a result, we looked at our well logs. We found an area of interest within the mango formation circled right here. We had to use this to interpret and go uh, with our um, gamma ray characteristic uh, of depositional environments. Doesn't look much right here. That's because it's compressed to incorporate the entire well. So the scale has to be changed. So once we change the scale, you actually see this sand package right here this uh, coarsening upward sand package. And the environment of deposition for this is basically a, a prograding delta front. So if you imagine the Mississippi Delta where it's depositing sand and it's going further and further out. And so as you're going from the outskirts to the middle of the delta, you're gonna get more and more sand material. And this is exactly what this is. And so this is important because our, our uh, environment of deposition has to line up with this. We go next and we look at our co coherence. Our coherence is telling us, okay, well, where, what faults and what stratigraphic features can we point out in here? As you can see, our, uh, as mentioned earlier, our Cape Eggman fault zone, this is the fault zone going straight through the middle of the survey. This is important. This is our track. As, as you can see, there's a geomorphological feature just located right here, which is important. This is going and backing up our interpretation with our well log and saying, look, in this area, we should find turbidite deposits. And what we have right here is the turbidite deposit, or what we interpret to be a turbidite deposit. So after that, we need to say, okay, well, it doesn't matter if there's a feature right there. We need to see if there's any amplitude to go along with this. So we look at the amplitude, and as seen earlier, we have a, a bright amplitude, which is good for us. And then we use the average energy to really bring out this amplitude and really emphasize. And so we see that it's brightening as we get to the crest of the feature, which is good, which is fantastic, because that's more gas saturation in that area. And after that, we do our AVO analysis, and we look at our uh, map of the, the horizon of interest. And so this is that geomorphological feature that we pointed out in the coherence, and this is the amplitude of that. And so this is a structure, uh, time structure overlaying on this. And it's important because we have a parallel fault right here, Cape Egmont fault zone. And as you go from this end to this end, this is your structural high. And so fluids underground flow from uh, lows to highs. So what we need is, what we interpret as a full petroleum system is your source rocks underneath, they're migrating up through this fault. They're coming from your lows, going to your structural highs, 
and you have a trap along this fault with your shales right above it to where it can't go anywhere else. And this is sort of backed up with these amplitudes because as you go from the lower to the higher, your amplitudes actually increase in signifying that there's a more uh, concentration of gas in that area. And so uh, along with our depositional environment, you can see this tail end being a channel end and this lobe end being more of a deposition or delta front. And so what we can do from here is you're not going to see a tail end on the front of your, your uh, delta lobe. And so we can uh, conclude that the direction of deposition is from this end all the way to the, uh, from, from southwest to northeast, which fits with a uh, paleo depositional map in that area. So we look at the results of this. These are our angle stacks. This is near, mid, and fars, and this is for AVO analysis. So right here we have B to B prime, which is inside of our amplitude. So B to B prime. Each these or each of these are a single point, but we're looking at the angle of offset for each point. And as you can see, there's a strong decrease in our amplitude. We go from really really bright almost to a whiteout. So from really really negative to almost zero for each one of these inside. Now we look at the outside of this reservoir and where we see the amplitude anomaly C to C prime, C to C prime, this blue line marks that same horizon, but we don't really see that uh, significant of an offset. We still have a little bit of, um, of decrease in amplitude, but the, the signature for this and the amount of decrease has changed. So we take up each individual uh, offset, so we, in this case, we don't have angles, we just have uh, a conglomerate of nears, mids, and fars, and we take a sample of each one of these for inside and outside, and this is important because we're going to put this in an AVO crossplot. We go to the AVO crossplot, and as you can see, there's a huge difference between uh, the two. The blue is representative of the um, amplitudes within the anomaly, and as you can see, we're going from... Uh, around negative two, uh, 275 to around 150 or so. And so what we're, we're getting is this large decrease in negative amplitude with offset. As we go from in, outside of the anomaly, we still get this decrease, but the rate of change is completely different from the two of these. And so the rate of change of this is a more drastic, which is important for us because that's, that's an even better signifier of, of gas in this case. So. Um, after doing that, what we have to do is we have to do the fluid replacement modeling. And with this, uh, th this is all of our inputs for Gassman's equation, which is important. We need to keep the rock properties exactly the same, but change the fluid properties. And so in order to do this, we have to input our wa original water saturation, we have our original resistivity, uh, P wave velocity, S wave velocity, and our uh, rock properties or, or, or rock um, composition. So after that we get our outputs of uh, what I put as 100% gas. This is 100% gas because we wanted an extreme case from the 100% water and we wanted something representative of our analog which is the core one field and that is just plain gas. So after that we get these modeled uh, wells, model density, model P wave, and model S wave. So here's a display of everything. Uh, what we have in red, that's our original curves. So we have our original P wave velocity, S wave velocity, and our original density. Our blues are the modeled uh, log curves. So the blue right here is our modeled P wave, modeled S wave, and modeled density. And this is important for us because we're taking and we're saying these rock properties have changed, specifically our P wave and specifically our density, and so these are going to give us different values in the subsurface. So what we do is we create um, an ABO synthetic, and basically we're modeling the seismic data. And we said, okay, in this interval, in the seismic data, what signature should we get for these fluids? And so we use the original fluid in place, which is the 100% the brine, and we look at this amplitude, we still get a decrease, but it's not as much. But if we go along and we look at where we have our 100% gas saturation, we get a larger um, amplitude and we still get a decrease uh, coming through. Not, uh, 
this one being not decreasing as, as fast as this one. And so this is pretty good for us. These are our results. And now we have to just compare them with reality. So whenever we look at our amplitude extractions, here we have our, uh, our area of interest within the Parahockey 3D survey. This is the amplitude extraction from the Cora 1 well. Both of these, you can see a lobe feature in here and a channel feature towards the end. Both of these line up with the paleo depositional environment. So now we're, we're using this to sort of back, even further back up our interpretation that this is a turbidite deposit. Going through, we're looking at our amplitudes. Right now, here we have our amplitude really popping out within our seismic cross section and on, on a, a uh, depositional high. Right here is the amplitude that was drilled on the Coral One well. And so it's, what it's sort of saying is like, you're not gonna expect a thick amplitude from here to here. It's gonna be thin and laterally con uh, uh, continuous, but you're gonna have these abrupt terminations to the left and right. So you take those characteristics, compare them together, they line up. And then we want to make sure, okay, well, our AVO cross plot. I mean, does, does that even make sense with reality? I mean, we're getting a class four. What does a class four usually look like? We have this uh, decrease in uh, amplitude with offset. Well, if you look at our AVO uh, model cross plots for different classes, class four is up here. Well, we go through here, we look, we have a really negative amplitude and it decreases with offset going towards zero. So we kind of look at that and we say, okay, that, that, that seems pretty good. Well, how does this compare with what we're actually seeing in our data? So we look at uh, our 100% brine saturation, characteristic for this, 100% gas saturation, and see what the characteristic is for that. And it's pretty simple to sort of draw a conclusion, okay, well, this is a lot lower amplitude and it's still decreasing, but not as much. It's comparable to the uh, angle stack outside of the amplitude. And we look at the gas saturation, really strong amplitude, and it decreases quite a bit from here to here. This is characteristic of inside the amplitude. So in conclusion, I mean, you can pretty much draw that these coherence, uh, coherence volumes are really pointing out these uh, geomorphological features and really helping to pinpoint locations of uh, interest within this underexplored area. Average energy really is just helping to, to really pop out and make sure that you have these lateral terminations and, and good amplitudes from your, your backgrounds. The AVO and fluid replacement modeling, that's just uh, helping us to compare what we see in reality versus what we would like to see. And uh, if you go back to here, I mean, it's pretty simple to, to draw that conclusion that brine signature represents the uh, outside of the amplitude, gas signature represents the inside of an amplitude. So in, in the big picture, this reservoir could contain 100% gas, not likely, but it helps to de-risk in the future that this could, uh, uh, this could contain a lot more gas than we think. And outside of the reservoir being all wet or containing nothing but water. And so, uh, these are pretty much the references that I used in this uh, project. And so, I mean, thanks, thanks for attending. If you have any questions or so, please feel free to ask. Let's get a round of applause for Ed. Good job. Good program, Greg. Good job. Other than graduating this number, as we'll let our judging panel have first shot at uh, asking questions. Yeah, that's just what it's over there. Uh, so here's the area of interest, right, where you're indicating that there may be some growing potential gas potential right here? Yes. Where is the, uh, the well here that was wet? The well that's wet is out here, right at the end of this line. Okay, so it's right on the edge. So you're yes. basically saying it's the same reservoir, and so the structure goes like this, and you're going up to it this way? Yes, yes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we're going to drill and probably right there. Yes, yes, that's exactly it. And you know, uh, you, you you can't blame them for for missing this area because I mean they they use the two D lines and so. Uh, this was drilled in ninety two, right? Yes, yes. Right, so, so um, what's the next step here? Is this going to be shared back with whoever is going to operate this field in New Zealand? If if y'all want to buy it, you can buy it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. The there none of this is leased. This is no, this all is all open acreage. Yeah, yeah. This is all open acreage. So New Zealand would have to put it up for sale. Yes, yes, yes. And you know if they have any plans to do that? 
Uh, probably within the next year or so. Uh, I mean, they, they've constantly, I think their bidding rounds are in February or March. Okay, next question. Do you have any work with engineers to, to quantify the size of this? How many acre feet could this be? How many cubic feet of gas could it hold, et cetera, be your next, the next step? Right. Yes, that, that, would, that would be the... That would be the next step in this. Uh, it's it's kind of hard because, um, I mean, the the aerial extent I can quantify, but as far as thick is pretty much just a guess. Uh, I did a, a previous, just for fun, I did a little bit of uh, modeling with it, and I came up to, I mean, at the thickest, it'd be 70 meters or so in, in some areas. But the aerial extent, I think I remember it was around, you know, I'm not even going to lie, I, I don't remember. <laughs> so. Is there anything different you've done in this analysis compared to the standard geophysical analysis others might do for the Gulf of Mexico project, for example? No, this is, a, this is pretty much applying a Gulf of Mexico analysis to New Zealand. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you, you just answered. I mean, what, you, what you've done is you look at a particular area using a pretty much known analysis to try to show how by taking that analysis you get a better idea of what a field looks like. Mm -hmm. right? Yes, yes. I'll tell you, I learned a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a good job explaining that. Yeah. Jack. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I learned a lot. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the one thing I was wondering was was this a typical kind of analysis applied to a new place? Or was there innovation in the analysis that you asked that question? We'll open the floor to any questions. Very good. Jay, excellent job.